It's my pleasure to come before you this morning once again, and this is day number five, and we're going to, uh, for the next three presentations, take up the subject of Islam and Bible prophecy. Uh, this is one of the uh, foundations of, of Adventism, and as we do a Bible study on Revelation 9, I think it's going to be very clear uh, that Islam does have a role in Bible prophecy uh, just as much as Israel has a role in Bible prophecy. And so we're going to begin looking at Islam and Bible prophecy, and then we will go through the trumpets and also the three woes. So at this time, let us kneel for a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, which art in heaven, we're thankful that there is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. And we want to be washed in his blood just now that we can be made whiter than snow, that our robes would be uh, white as the light, even as he is in the light, in whom is no darkness. And so we ask that the uh, prophetic light uh, that encircles the throne of God and even the light that encircles the uh, face of Jesus Christ, the glory of, of your knowledge might uh, beam down upon us. You said that when we proclaim the forgotten truths of Bible prophecy that there would be a harvest of souls. And so we ask for that spirit of good revival and reformation. Uh, we ask that you would again uh, be with those that are still traveling, that they might be able to make their destination safely. We thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take our Bibles now and turn to Revelation chapter 9. The Gospel of Revelation chapter 9. We're going to seek to study this whole chapter together. There are 21 verses, and we're going to do a text-by-text -text study. In Revelation chapter 9, as we deal with Islam and Bible prophecy, this is part 1. And we're beginning in verse 1 of Revelation chapter 9. It says here, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So here is the fifth angel, which is the fifth trumpet sounding. Now, we haven't gone through the first four trumpets, but we will cover those later on in the day. But we just want to put uh, this chapter into proper perspective so that when we go back and study the trumpets, we'll also be dealing with the three woes or the triple application of Bible prophecy. But a star falls from heaven. Now, we want to recognize that when we talk about stars in heaven, stars represent messengers. Uh, Revelation 120 will tell you that the seven churches have seven angels. These are not literal angels, but these are messengers for the, the, the Greek word angel means angelos or messenger. And when we look in Revelation 8, if you would just back up to Revelation 8, you will find that stars are messengers or leaders. They can also be uh, governmental or political figures as well. But in Revelation 8, as we look at the third uh, angel sounding in verse number 10 of Revelation 8, notice what it says. It says, And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountain of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Now, we're not studying this particular trumpet right now, but we will do so later on. But I just want you to recognize that we have a great star falling from heaven here, <coughs> burning as a lamp, and his name is called Wormwood. This was a particular leader. This was a, uh, a messenger, so to speak, and we'll be looking at him later on. But just showing the comparison between the third trumpet and the fifth trumpet, a star is a messenger or a great leader. And it can also be a, a king or a political figure. Let's notice in Numbers chapter 24. Numbers chapter 24. Numbers chapter 24. Would you agree that Jesus is the leader of the movement of Christianity? Amen. Yes. Uh, is Jesus 
identified in the Bible uh, with a star? Yes. The Bible tells us in Numbers 24. Numbers 24, verse 17, looking at the prophecies of Balaam. In Numbers 24, verse uh, 17, the Bible says here, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheph. So a star is to arise out of Jacob, and a scepter of Israel. Uh, those that have scepters are kings. Who is this star that would be a descendant of Jacob? and would wield the scepter of Israel. The Bible tells us in the book of Matthew, turn with me to Matthew, the New Testament, Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1. The Bible says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod of, of the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Here we see the fulfillment of Balaam's prophecy, Numbers 24, 17. Jesus was the star that was to come out of Jacob and have the scepter of Israel. He was born king of the Jews. So a star can be a king. It could also be a, a religious or political leader, all right? So at this point in Revelation 9, the star that falls from heaven, we're not necessarily identifying who that star is, but this star is a, is a messenger, okay? This star is a, is a leader, and when we study it later on, you'll find that that star fall from heaven can be seen in both ways, or, or, or two understandings, but they don't contradict each other. All right, and we'll be looking at that later. But so far, we just want to put in our minds that this star is a messenger and or a leader, okay? It could be a religious leader, and it could be a political leader like a king, okay? So we will deal with that later on as we study the prophecy. But it says in Revelation 9-1, the star falls from heaven, and it says, and unto him was given something. What was given to him? It was a key that was given, and the key was given for the purpose of unlocking the bottomless pit. Okay, what is the bottomless pit that is being opened up by this fallen star here, okay? Let's notice in the book of Genesis. Turn to Genesis chapter 1. Interesting that when we look at the word pit in the Strong's Concordance, the word pit pit in the Greek comes from a word which is abusos, abusos, all right, abusos. Now, when we come to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2, we find these words. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, the earth here is mentioned in its state or form before man was created. And it says that it was uh, without form, void, and darkness. And it says darkness was upon the face of the deep. Okay, now that word deep there is the same a uh, word that you find in Revelation 9-1, pit, which is abusos, we find that this word deep here is the Hebrew version, which simply means abyss. <coughs> All right, so this word deep means abyss, okay? And the abyss is talking about a dark, void, formless condition of the earth, okay? So... We're connecting Revelation 9-1, the, the pit, which means abusos in the Greek, with this word deep here, which is talking about the abyss, which is speaking about the earth, which is dark and no light, and it is formless. Okay, now let's get better description now by going to other places in the Bible. Let's come to Jeremiah chapter 4. 
Keep it in mind that the abyss is a is the earth in a void and dark condition, formless. In Jeremiah chapter 4, Jeremiah chapter 4, beginning with verse 23. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23. The Bible says, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. Does that sound familiar to us? We just read that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. The same characteristics. Earth without form, void, heavens, they had no light, so it was dark. Verse 24, I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man and all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. So notice, in verse 23, it gives us the same descriptions of the earth as we read in Genesis chapter 1. It says, no light, there was darkness it was void it says that there was no man it says there was no birds okay exactly how it was before man was created and the light but then it connects a word with this condition or this description in verse 26 I beheld and lo the fruitful place was a wilderness okay so notice we're connecting the pit, which is the abusos, with the earth as it is without light and no man, no inhabitant. And we also see, according to Jeremiah chapter 4, that connected with this is the wilderness. Okay, so associated with the pit, which is the abusos, which is the earth without form or without man or without light is the wilderness. All right, now turn to Jeremiah chapter 2, and let's all put this together. We're trying to determine from the Bible what is this bottomless pit. In Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 6, Jeremiah 2 verse 6 says, Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts, and of pits, through a land of drought and of the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelt. What we have done is we have combined what we've read in Genesis and also in Jeremiah 4. What we see here associated with the wilderness is the pit and the desert, which no man dwelt in and no man passed through. So what do we find here? The bottomless pit is talking about a the earth or a desert which is like unto a wilderness where it is densely populated no. No. <coughs> <coughs> not densely populated all right almost uninhabited okay uh, scarcely inhabited all right so the bottomless pit is talking about the desert a wilderness place, all right? So we're talking about a desert wilderness country, all right? Now, let's turn back to Revelation 9. <coughs> Bombless pit equals a desert wilderness spot on the earth, all right? So we're talking about a desert or a wilderness area here. And in verse 2, it says, and he opened the bottomless pit, and there rose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. So once the bottomless pit is opened up, or this desert wilderness is opened up, there comes a smoke. And how does the Bible describe this smoke? It's the smoke of a great what? Furnace. All right? The smoke of a furnace. Now, let's look at that word furnace from the Bible and see what we're talking about. What is this smoke doing? It's the smoke of a furnace, and it's designed to darken the sun in the air. 
All right, now let's notice in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4, we're focusing on the word furnace. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Out of this desert, out of this wilderness comes a smoking furnace, or the smoke like a furnace, which brings darkness to the sun and air. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 20. Bible says in Deuteronomy 4.20, But the Lord hath taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance as you are this day. What do we see associated here with the word furnace? Iron. Very good. And what else? Egypt. What does Egypt often represent in the Bible? When we think about Egypt, what do we think about? Freedom? No, we think of bondage and slavery all right so the smoke of this furnace this smoking furnace is going to cause bondage and slavery all right bondage and slavery now notice also in Isaiah 48 turn to the book of Isaiah chapter 48 verse 10 so this smoke of furnace of darkness this is almost this is an Egyptian darkness, Egyptian furnace, which is associated with bondage and slavery, all right? So out of the wilderness, out of this desert, is going to come forth bondage and slavery, all right? Egyptian darkness, all right? Let's notice Isaiah 48. Isaiah 48, verse 10. Bible says in Isaiah 48, 10, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. What word do we see associated with furnace? Affliction. When you think of affliction, what comes to your mind? Pain. Pain. Suffering. Suffering. Very good. What else? Pain, suffering. Okay, we got slavery with, 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 with the furnace of Egypt. How about persecution? Do people that are being persecuted, do they suffer uh, pain? Yes. So affliction here is dealing with pain, suffering, persecution. Okay, so out of this bottomless pit, which is a desert-like wilderness region, there would come a smoke of furnace. Okay, the furnace is associated with bondage and slavery and also affliction or persecution all right bondage slavery and persecution now what does the smoke of this furnace do to the sun and air it darkens it so now what is darkness turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 26 the New Testament book of Acts 26 Acts 26, Acts 26, beginning with verse 17. What is darkness, all right? Acts 26, verse 17. It says here, Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. What do we see darkness representing here? The power of Satan. All right, the power of Satan. So notice this uh, smoke that comes out of the bombless pit wilderness desert country it is the smoke of a furnace the furnace represents bondage slavery affliction persecution now when we think of persecution we normally think of what when we talk of persecution <clears throat> when the children of Israel were in Egypt were they being persecuted how were they being persecuted were they being persecuted politically or religiously? Both. 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 
So we're seeing out of this wilderness, out of this desert, is going to come forth bondage, slavery, religious and political persecution, and the darkness is going to cover the sun and the air, and the darkness is associated with the power of who? Satan. And does not the power of Satan bring one into bondage? Does not the power of Satan bring one into slavery? Does not the power of Satan cause men to want to persecute others? Yes, so out of this bottomless pit, the desert, will come bondage, slavery, religious, political persecution, <coughs> the power of Satan will darken the sun and the air. Now, what is the sun in Bible prophecy? Turn to Malachi, book of Malachi, chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. Keep in mind, bondage, slavery, affliction, religious, political persecution, power of Satan is all coming out of this bottomless pit. It's coming from this desert wilderness region of the, of the earth. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2. But unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. What is the son called here? Son of what? Righteousness. righteousness. Okay, son of righteousness. Who's righteousness? Right. Okay, message of the covenant. Okay, Christ's righteousness. Uh, question, where is the righteousness of Christ revealed? In the sequel. That's That's correct. That's correct, but I want us to think real simple now, okay? Okay, yes, in his people, 104,000 Jerusalem, yes, that's all correct. Calvary, yes. But were we there when he died on the cross? No, no we weren't there. So how does one come to understand about Calvary? Okay, the Bible, yes, getting closer. And what does the Bible reveal? The gospel. The gospel. The gospel. I told you to think simple, all right? Turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. I know that you can't help bring out those answers because they're all in our minds based upon what we have studied thus far, all right? And I'm not asking you to forget about what we've studied thus far because we still need to use it, but... Romans chapter 1, listen to what it says. Romans chapter 1, verse 15. So as much as, it, as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, or inside, the gospel is... The righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So, in the gospel is revealed the righteousness of God, which is Christ. So, therefore, the son of righteousness, righteousness is revealed in the gospel. Therefore, the son then becomes a symbol of what? The gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ and his righteousness. So notice, the sun was darkened by the smoke that is like a furnace. In other words, the power of Satan is going to obscure or hide or cover up the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is Christianity, and the smoke brings forth bondage, slavery, persecution, and affliction. All right? Now, what does the air represent? The sun is the gospel 
of Jesus Christ. What is the heir? Turn with me to John chapter 3. St. John chapter 3 in the New Testament, verse 8. <clears throat> John chapter 3 in verse 8. It says, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Spirit. What here represents the Holy Spirit? The wind. Is there not fresh air or stale air in the wind? Does not the wind, car does not the wind carry air with it? It does. Notice John chapter 20. St. John chapter 20. St. John 20. And verse... 21. John 20, verse 21. John 20, verse 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Breath also has air as well. So then, the Son represents the gospel of Jesus Christ. What does the air represent, which was darkened by the power of Satan? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. So notice. The smoke that comes out from the bottomless pit, which is the desert wilderness area, is the, is the smoke of a furnace. The furnace is associated with bondage, slavery, persecution. The sun, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the air, the Holy Spirit, is being darkened by the power of Satan. All right? Now, there's something else now that's about to come out of the bottomless pit. So whatever now that we're about to read that comes out of the bottomless pit, you can know that whatever comes out, they are under bondage, slavery, persecution. They're going to be blinded to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost because they're going to be under the power of Satan. All right? Now let's go to Revelation 9. Revelation 9. Revelation 9. Revelation 9. Verse 3. Revelation 9, 3. Listen to what it says. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. So what comes out of this bottomless pit? Locusts. And to them it says, power was given as the power of scorpions. Let's deal with the locusts. What are these locusts? Turn with me to the book of Nahum, or Nahum. The book of Nahum. All right. That's one you got to search for because when's the last time we've read the book of Nahum? Nahum chapter 3. Nahum chapter 3, right after Micah, right before Habakkuk. Nahum chapter 3, verse 15. The Bible says, There shall the fire devour thee, the sword shall cut thee off, it shall eat thee up like the canker worm. Make thyself many as the canker worm, make thyself many as the locusts. Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven. The canker worm spoileth and flieth away. Thy crowned are as the locusts, and thy captains as the great grasshoppers, which camp in the hedges in the cold day. But when the sun ariseth, they flee away, and their place is not known where they are. All right? So, Bible here is calling the locusts grasshoppers. Another word for Locust is the grasshopper. Grasshoppers are locusts, and locusts are grasshoppers. And it's interesting, it says that when the sun ariseth, they flee away. Why? Because in Revelation 9, these locusts move in darkness. They're under darkness. The sun and the air are darkened to them. Remember, the sun represents the gospel of Jesus Christ.
and the air represents the Holy Ghost. But these locusts would not know the gospel of Jesus Christ. They would not know the Holy Ghost because they're under the power of Satan. And therefore, they're under bondage. They're under slavery and affliction. All right. Now, turn with me to the book of Judges. Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7. Remember, locust equal grasshopper. Grasshopper is locust. What are the locusts? Grasshopper. What's the grasshopper? Locust. Okay. Judges chapter 7, verse 12. Bible says, and the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the West, the East, lay in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude and their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside for multitude. What do we see here? Yes, the threefold union, all right, yes. But grasshoppers are locusts. Locusts are grasshoppers, but here we see the Midianites, the Amalekites, the children of the east lay all along the valley like grasshoppers or locusts. So the locusts, the locusts are the children of the east which come from the desert, which is in the wilderness, which do not believe or know the gospel of Jesus Christ or the Holy Ghost because they're under the darkness of Satan. Therefore, they are in bondage because Jesus Christ says, the truth shall make you free, and if the Son will make you free, you'll be free indeed. So because they don't believe in Christ, they're in bondage. They're in slavery. They're under affliction. All right? The children of the East, Amalekites, and the Midianites, children of the East. And what do the children of the East ride upon here in this verse? They have camels. So put this in your mind. The East, the desert... The wilderness, camels, do not believe in Jesus Christ or the Holy Ghost because they're under the darkness of Satan. All right? Now, go to Proverbs chapter 30 with me. Proverbs chapter 30, another interesting characteristic that we find about locusts. So we're talking about locusts that live and come from the desert wilderness from the east, the eastern desert in the wilderness. And they ride upon camels. Proverbs chapter 30. Everybody's together? Anyone lost? All right, Proverbs 30, verse 27. Proverbs 30, verse 27, it says, The locusts have no king, yet go they forth, all of them by bands. Okay, so these locusts don't have a particular king, okay? That's what Solomon said in a physical, in a, in a, in a literal sense. In the same sense, these locusts in Revelation 9, they're not going to have a king over them at this point. But they all go forth in bands, so they're all united. So there's something that is uniting them, something that is causing them to be gathered together for one purpose. They're of one mind, one consent, all right? Now, the Bible says that these locusts come out of the pit, so they're under the darkness of Satan. They're in bondage. They're in slavery because they don't know the Son, the gospel of Jesus Christ, or the Holy Spirit. All right? They are from the east, okay? Desert wilderness. They have camels. They have no king over them at this point. Now, the Bible says that to them was given something. They were given power. Power as the scorpions. Now, now, notice, what do you think would happen if a man is under the power of Satan? 
does it know Jesus Christ or the Holy Ghost and is given power? What do you think that man would do under the influence of Satan, not knowing Christ or the Holy Spirit? What would they do with that power? Do you think that, do you think that, that power would corrupt them? Yes. Do you think that they would abuse that power? Do you think that they may try to persecute or kill or hurt others? <clears throat> now, in the Bible, especially in Revelation, turn to Revelation, let me share something with you. When you look at this phrase, and maybe this is something you haven't looked at before, but when you look at the phrase, to them were given power. Oftentimes, when someone is given power in the book of Revelation, they normally use that power to kill or persecute. Let's look at it in Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. Let's come to the second seal. The second seal, or the second horse, in Revelation chapter 6, verse number three. It says, and when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second be saying, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. What do we find here? Power is given to this rider on this red horse. And what does he do with that power? Does he bring peace? No, he takes peace away from the earth that they should what? Kill one another and he has a great sword. All right? So these locusts, these, these men, these children of the east from the desert, from the wilderness that don't believe in Jesus Christ, don't believe in the Holy Ghost under the power of Satan and bondage, slavery, power is given unto them. What do you think these, these, these locusts, who are the children of the east, what do you think they're going to do with that power? They're going to take away peace. They will, not be a, they will not be a power of peace or religion of peace. They will take away peace and they will kill. Notice in the same chapter, look at the fourth seal, verse 7. Verse 7 of Revelation 6, and when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see, and I looked, and lo, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed uh, with him, and power was given uh, them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, hunger, death, and beasts of the earth. What do we find here? When power is given to this rider on the pale horse, what does he do? Kill by, by what means? Sword, hunger, death, beasts of the earth, all right? We see the same thing, persecution. All right, now turn to Revelation 13 with me. Revelation 13, last place we see this, this thought. Revelation 13, Revelation chapter 13, verse 5. Revelation 13, 5 says, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 42 months. Now, who is this uh, beast that is given power? Who is this beast that continues for 42 months when he has power? Papacy, Papacy okay. And what does he do with that power? Look at verse 7. Verse 7, well, we can look at verse 6. And he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. What did the papacy do with that power for 42 months over every kindred and, and nation and tongue? What did they do? They killed 50 million. Or 50. Persecuting. So in other words, the locusts that come out of the bottomless pit, which is a desert region or wilderness in the earth. They are the children of the east. They ride on camels. They do not believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ or the Holy Ghost. Why? Because it is darkened to their mind and understanding. Why? Because they're under the influence of Satan. They're under bondage and slavery. Therefore, they bring bondage and slavery and affliction and persecution 
to those who are not of the same mind of them. But the Bible says that power is given unto them like the scorpions have power. What does the scorpion represent now? All right, turn to Luke chapter 10. We know that the locusts represent the grasshoppers. The grasshoppers were the Midianites, the Amalekites, the children of the east with camels. From the desert, from the wilderness, out of the bottomless pit. In other words, this is a satanic persecuting power. It's a satanic persecuting power with a satanic religion, false religion, counterfeit to the gospel of Christ and the Holy Spirit. Now, the Bible says here in Luke, Luke chapter 10, notice Luke, the 10th chapter, Luke 10, Luke 10, it says here, verse 17, and the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now here, we see Jesus giving power. Oftentimes in the Bible, either one receives power from Christ or power from Satan. But in verse 8, 9, 8 19, he says, I give you the power to tread on what? Serpents, Serpents and scorpions. And what do the scorpions represent? He says, and over all the power of the enemy. So the scorpion power represents the power of who? The enemy. And who is the enemy? Satan. So these locusts, these children of the east from the desert, from the wilderness, are operating, and they're being motivated by Satan's power to do what? To persecute. And how would they persecute? They would bring bondage and slavery and death. All right, now, turn to Revelation 9. We'll find something interesting here in Revelation 9, verse 4. Revelation 9, verse 4. Revelation chapter 9, verse 4. Revelation 9, verse 4. Bible says, and it, com and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tor that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when it striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Interesting. Even though these locusts, which are the children of the east, from the desert and from the wilderness, they don't believe in Christ or the Holy Ghost because, it, because they're under the darkness and delusions of Satan, and they would be a persecuting power, and they would have demonic power, but the Bible shows us who's directing them. It was commanded them, the Bible says in verse 4, that they shouldn't hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Now, very quickly, what is the grass? And what is the tree? What is the grass and what is the tree? Based upon the text, we know it's men, but we want to understand this upon the testimony of two or three. A thing is established. So let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. Verse 7. Isaiah 40, verse 7. Isaiah 40, verse 7. The Bible says in Isaiah 40, verse 7, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. What is the people here in Isaiah 40, verse 7? Grass. Surely the people is grass. Grass represent the people. What about the trees? Turn with me in your Bibles to Mark, the book of Mark. Book of Mark. Mark 8. Mark chapter 8 in the New Testament. Mark chapter 8, verse 22. Book of Mark chapter 8, verse 22. The Bible says, and... He cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. 
And he touched the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up, and he was restored and saw every man how? Clearly. So Jesus heals this man how? How does Jesus heal this man's blindness? Or what type of blindness does he heal first? The, the spiritual blindness or the physical blindness? Let me ask the question again. Which blindness does he heal? The spiritual blindness first or the physical blindness first? Spiritual, spiritual blindness first. How do we know? Because when he put his eyes on him the first time, when he put his hands on his eyes the first time, he said, What? I see men as what? I see men as trees. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and he said, What? I saw every man clearly. Okay, so the first healing is spiritual. Second is, but yes, that is interesting. Why? Because in the last days, we have a church that is poor, blind, wretched, miserable, and naked. And they need to be healed spiritually. The eyes represent the eyes of understanding. The eyes represent the prophet. The eyes also represent prophecy by which you could see afar off. But a blind church can't see afar off. And a blind church does not like to read or follow or obey the prophet's writings. Therefore, Laodicea needs spiritual healing more than they do physical healing. Spiritual healing first so that they could see everything clearly. But the trees are people. The grass is people. We're talking about people here. We're talking about men. So notice, what do we find here then? The command is given to them, don't hurt the grass, don't hurt the trees, do not hurt the men that have the seal of God. The seal of God is the Sabbath truth, commandment keepers. So there were commandment keepers that were living in this region of the east where the desert wilderness is. All right? Now, notice something. Who's directing these locusts? Look, even though they're under the power of Satan, they don't believe in Christ or the Holy Spirit. They bring bondage and slavery and death and persecution. But who's directing them? God. Has to be God. Why? Because he you want, you, want me to, you want me to tell you why it's God? Because if Satan was directing them, do you think Satan would cause his people to spare those that have the seal of God? Doesn't Satan want to blot out the commandment-keeping people of God? Doesn't he want to destroy people that have the seal of God? Yes, so if Satan had the power, he would wipe out everyone. But God says, you can wipe out everybody, but do not touch the people that have the seal of God. You see, God <coughs> is in control. God is directing these locusts, which are the children of the East. And they're bringing persecution and bondage and death to, an, uh, to, to people that don't have the seal of God. So in other words, if you don't have the seal of God, then you're not a worshiper of the true God. You're not a worshiper, you're not a keeper of the commandments of God. Listen, if you're not a commandment keeper, and if you don't worship God, then by default, what are you? And who are the ones that are commandment breakers? They are idolaters. They are worshipers of false gods. You either keep the commandments of God, you worship the true God, you keep the commandments of men, you are a worshiper of false gods. You worship idols. So these locusts, they're going to persecute, they're going to scourge, they're going to bring bondage, they're going to bring death, they're going to bring darkness through their false teachings to an apostate people that do not worship the true God of heaven by keeping his commandments. Is everybody with me? Okay, now, let me, when, now, when you think of these locusts, these locusts were told, don't hurt these trees or the grass. Locusts 
come with darkness. Have we seen this picture somewhere else before? Trees, grass, darkness, locusts being used as a plague? Egypt? Turn to Exodus chapter 10. I want to share something with you. These locusts in Revelation 9, these men, they would torment people. They would, they would hurt them. They would persecute them with the power of Satan. They would be a chastisement. They would be a scourge. But they would not touch the people that have the seal of God. God is the one that's directing. God is in, the, is in control of the course of human events and the earth. Exodus chapter 10. <coughs> Exodus chapter 10, verse 12. Notice, Exodus 10, 12 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thy hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come up upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land, even all that the hail hath left. And Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought a west wind, east wind, upon all the land and all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. And the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested in all the coasts of Egypt. Very grievous were they before them. There were, such, there were no such locusts as they, neither after them shall be such. For they covered the face of the whole earth so that the land was darkened and they did eat every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left and there remained not any green things in the trees or in the herbs of the field throughout all the land of Egypt now before we read verse 16 who is directing these locusts I just don't answer now but who is it that is bringing these locusts to Egypt all right verse 16 then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste, and he said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now, therefore, forgive, I pray thee, my sin, only this once, entreat the Lord your God that he may take away from me this death only. Who brought the locusts into Egypt? It was God. Why did he bring them into Egypt? The locusts were the instruments or the tool of God to bring down the kingdom of Egypt. Pharaoh's kingdom is falling apart. We read a text earlier that said that I brought you out of Egypt, even the golden furnace. Uh-uh. Iron furnace. Egypt is the iron kingdom. Is there another kingdom in Bible prophecy which is known as the iron kingdom? Rome. Rome. So notice, these locusts here are commanded by God to destroy the trees. That's interesting, because if you read a, a text in Deuteronomy 20, verse 19, Deuteronomy 20, 19, it says when the, when the children of Israel were to conquer a new land, it, it said, do not cut the trees down. You know why? Because the tree of the field is man's life. So the locusts come to destroy and to bring down Egypt, which is the Iron Kingdom, the Iron Furnace. Pharaoh said, look, I've sinned. Wait a minute, how does one know that they sin? Especially a sun worshiper who didn't even acknowledge God. How, do, how can one know that they've sinned? How be it when he has come, the Holy Spirit, he will convict you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. In other words, this is, this is the power of the Holy Spirit. Using these locusts, which are a satanic power, to bring what? Judgment? To bring what? Chastisement to Pharaoh? Why? Because he's lifted up himself against the God of heaven. He's exalted himself against God's law and his people. So the locusts are used by God to bring down Egypt, all right? 
I keep on emphasizing that for a reason. The locusts are a satanic power. They're the children of the east, from the desert, uh, in the wilderness. They don't believe in Christ. They don't believe in the Holy Ghost. They have power given to them as scorpions. They are to persecute people, to, to torment them, afflict them. But to afflict who? Not just anybody. People that don't have the seal of God. And Pharaoh and his people did not have the seal of God because they weren't commandment keepers. They were commandment breakers. They were idol worshipers. These locusts, listen, these locusts are designed to bring chastisement and persecution and death to idol worshipers. All right? So now, go back to Revelation 9. We, we, we only have a few more minutes now. We haven't identified who they are. We're about to do that right now. But if God makes you of quick understanding, then with all this scripture evidence, it should be very plain who they are, but just in case. And, and, and notice, have we, went to, have we went outside the Bible this morning? Oh, no. We haven't went to any other sources. We, we have been in this book identifying this power of prophecy. Now, now let's go to Revelation 9. Okay, we're going to finish up here. For the sake of time, I'm not going to deal with the five months now. I'll do that in the next study. Let's come to verse 7 now, okay, because we're going to have to close very soon. Revelation 9, 7. Okay, these men were going to torment and afflict people with religious and political persecution, but it's the idol worshipers, okay? It's the people that have the same religion of Egypt, which is spiritualism, paganism, sun worship. Okay, verse 7. And the shape of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the face of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron. The sound of the wings uh, was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle, and they had tails like unto scorpions, and uh, there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. All right. Let's see. All right, let's deal with this tail. I, all right, let's deal with this tail. I need to put these things into the record. Go to Isaiah chapter 9. Let's deal with the tail. The, the scorpions have, have tails. And when we look at the scorpion, that's where his power is, in his stinger. All right, he touches you. It could be very, you could die. And if you don't die, it could be so painful that you wish you did die. That's exactly what the Bible says. So what, what is that scorpion sting? Remember, this is demonic power. We're in Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9, verse 15. Real quick, Isaiah 9, 15. The ancient and the honorable, he is the head. And the prophet that teacheth lies, he is the tail. Isaiah 9, 15. The prophet that teacheth lies is the tail. Wait a minute. A prophet that teaches lies. What, what kind of a prophet is that? A prophet that lies. True prophet, right? False. false prophet. So we're talking about false prophets from the east, in the desert, in the wilderness, don't believe in Christ, don't believe in the Holy Ghost, darkened by the influence and power of Satan. Their relig religion brings bondage and death and persecution to those that do not serve the true God. Now, false prophets, they teach lies. They teach false doctrines. What are some of the lies that the false prophet teaches from the East? Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 John. All right, 1 John. 1 John. 1 John, 1 John. Let's look at some of these lies real quick. 1 John, chapter 2. 1 John, chapter 2. 1 John, chapter 2. Verse 3. 1 John, chapter 2, verse 3 says, And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. One of the lies that the false prophet would teach is that they would introduce a new 
day of worship. They wouldn't worship on the seven-day Sabbath. They would have a, a Sabbath of their own creating, thus breaking the commandments of God. All right? That's one lie. Here's another lie. In verse 22 of the same chapter, verse 22, verse 22 of 1 John 2, who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same if not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. So wait a minute. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist. So notice. These locusts, these children of the east from the desert, from the wilderness, they would have a false Sabbath. And also, they would teach that Jesus is not God. They would not believe in him as the divine son of God. That's Antichrist. That's, that is lying, okay? So their false prophets would teach a false Sabbath. They would teach that Jesus is not the son of God. All right? And here's another one, 1 John 4. 1 John 4, verse 1. All right. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they, be, whether they are of God, because many true prophets are gone out into the world. False prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come even now already is it in the world. So not only would this power deny Jesus' divinity, they would even deny his humanity. They would deny him coming in the human flesh. In other words, Jesus didn't take on the same flesh we had. It's not possible that a man can have a, a sinless life, have the same nature as we, but yet he doesn't commit one sin, not even word and thought and action. How could he do all those miracles? How could he raise the dead and cleanse the leper and give sight to the blind and, and, and give strength to the feet of the lame to walk? He never came to this earth. No, he was an imposter. So they would deny his divinity and they would deny his humanity. This is what their false prophets would teach. False Sabbath, denying the divinity of Christ and the humanity of Christ. Who are these locusts? Well, I was going to try to fit in the rest of what I was going to do. But I think that this is a very good place to stop because right now, if I were you, I would be on the edge of my seat. And that's exactly where I want to leave you, right there. So this is what we have so far. The bottomless, a star falls from heaven. Okay, a leader, a messenger, the key is given to the bottomless pit. The bottomless pit is a place that is not inhabited. It is, it, is a, it is a desert. It is a wilderness region. The smoke of furnace comes out of the pit, and it darkens the sun in the air. The smoke brings the locusts. The furnace represents bondage. It represents uh, slavery. It represents affliction and persecution. The locusts are the children of, men, uh, children of the east from the desert wilderness. They would not believe in Jesus Christ. They would not believe in the Holy Ghost because they would be under the power of Satan. Yet power was given unto them as the scorpions have power, and they were to torment and to afflict and to persecute idol worshipers. They are being used by God as providential forces to bring down an apostate people in this part of the world. 
Bible says that their power is in their tails. With their tails, that's how they sting and torment and afflict people. So they would sting people, they would afflict people with their false doctrines. They would force people to convert to their religion, which would introduce a false Sabbath, would introduce ultimately a false Christ or Messiah because they don't believe in Jesus as the divine Son of God or his humanity. Who are these children of the East? We will find out the next time we have our next meeting. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your holy word. For thy word is true from the beginning. And we thank you that you have given it to us in book form. Your written divine communication and will to mankind. We pray that as we continue to study this chapter of Revelation 9, as we continue to look at these prophetic locusts, I pray that it will be very clear from the Bible and the Bible only who this power is. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for Jesus Christ, the divine revelator, the one that opens and seals the book. For he is worthy by virtue of what he has done on the cross for each and every one of us. We thank you that he is our Savior. Thankful that he is our Redeemer. He's our High Priest. He's our friend and he's our coming King. And we ask that he might abide with us this day as we go through the rest of our prophetic study. In Jesus' name, amen.